Hi everyone, welcome to Human to Human. I'm your host Sarah Scher, and this is the very first season of the University of Manitoba's Anthropology Department podcast, where I hope to explore the topic of anthropology through conversation with faculty and students so that everyone can have a better understanding of what anthropology is and can be. This podcast was also created on a campus located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people in the homeland of the Métis Nation. As a podcast dedicated to anthropology, this project is also a part of the Anthropology Department's commitment to community engagement and research on the rich, diverse, and multifaceted ways of being human. Once again, I'm your host Sarah Scher, and this is Human to Human. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us on today's episode of Human to Human. I'm Sarah, and I'd like to give a warm welcome to my guest, Dr. Warren Clark. Dr. Clark is a sociocultural anthropologist, as well as an assistant professor in anthropology at the University of Manitoba, whose research interests have lied in topics of youth cultures, social citizenship, neoliberalism, race and ethnicity, anti-colonialism, and masculinity. A couple of Dr. Clark's most recent projects have included founding the Afro-Caribbean Mentorship Program, which provides mentorship to university students in racialized communities to help empower them to succeed in their educational and professional goals as well as founding the Barbershop Talks, which is a series of events where barbershops are used to create a safe space for Black community members to meet and discuss their experiences. These talks are also available online, and the link will be shared in this episode's description box down below. Dr. Clark, it's so nice to be able to chat with you today. Thank you very much for having me. Much appreciated. Yeah, You're appreciated. Thank you for being here. Yes, yes, thank you. So. I actually have not had a course with you okay. uh, yet, <laughs> but so we met for the first time in the preparation for this podcast. Yes. But I'm also signed up for one of your classes next semester. So oh, you I'm are? pretty excited. Okay, okay. And that's anthropology and contemporary social issues, I believe. Yes, yes. It's um, fourth, uh, fourth year and uh, I taught it as a graduate course as well last year. Okay. Or actually this year because it was winter I taught it. But yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be awesome. And I also attended your recent talk, How to Get into Grad School. So you've been quite busy with your different projects mm-hmm. with students and helping them attain, I guess, their educational goals. Yeah, yeah. The secret is I'm Batman. And I'm looking <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking for my replacement. No, I'm just joking. But um, <laughs> uh, paying it forward is one of the things that um, I believe is the right thing for me to do. Um, I think we all have a little bit of, or if not a lot of knowledge, uh, that we can give other people that can benefit, right? And, um, you know, uh, I'd be lying to folks if I said I got here on my own because that would be a lie I didn't, mm. right? So I think um, with all the work that I do, although it's um, hard work, it's heart work, mm. um, and um, it makes me feel good. Just even sitting here knowing that this is, you know, helping with you and your projects and your future endeavors, I think this is awesome. It's a win-win. Oh, thank you. So before we get into talking about some of your research and the community <coughs> projects that you're involved in, yeah. I would like to hear about how your interest in anthropology began and oh. yeah, how you decided that this was a field that you wanted to study. Yeah, that's thanks to um, Professor Malcolm Br- uh, Blinko, who is now retired uh, from New York University. Um, so how I got into anthropology was a beautiful accident. Um, you know, I went back to study formally in in, uh, in 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 educational institution in 2009 at York University. Uh, I stumbled across anthropology because uh, it was one of the uh, courses you had to take. Um, I, I I applied for criminology, but I, then I majored in African studies, um, and then anthropology was one of the courses you had to take in African studies. And uh, it was mind blowing. I I didn't even know what anthropology was, but I I felt this was something I have to do and I'm going to do it. Um, I didn't know how I was going to do it. <laughs> that part wasn't too clear. <laughs> um, not until the second year when I took a public anthropology course, uh, which I understood how we can mobilize anthropological ideas and, and theories in community. Uh, Robert Pawlowski, sorry, um, he's a public anthropologist who um, encourages us anthropologists to, to lean into public anthropology and working with community. So um, that was the foundation, but um, but fourth year uh, undergraduate uh, as undergraduate student at York University, it was Professor Blinko who really pushed me um, to be uh, to be an anthropologist, you know. And he believed in me, and I didn't even believe in myself. 
to do what I'm doing now, which is so it's just surreal. You know, just thinking about it, it's just like, wow, that's actually happened, you know what I mean? Um, but he, um, although I wanted to slash his tires many times because <laughs> he pushed okay. me so hard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Warren tease it out and he would just rub his two fingers and he would do that with only me. And I was to be like, oh, why are you doing this? I mean, your, yeah. your car is mine, you know, like and uh, it was only the, the last class of the semester where he asked me a question and I was able to answer, answer the question with uh, with uh, a lot of critical reflection. And um, and in his words, as an anthrop- uh, as an anthropologist, and I was like, "Well, I did that. Oh, I didn't even know I did that." Uh, so um, I remember he he said to me after that class, he said, "We have to go talk about this." And I was like, "Okay." And um, he was my Victor Frankenstein, metaphorically speaking. He was creating something that I did not know, and um, it was beautiful because I ended up being. Um, you know, a social culture anthropologist, uh, assistant professor at the University of Manitoba. So, um, again, you know, that was him paying it forward to me and um, spending time with me. And um, I can't forget those moments, right? And I just do the same for students. So this was in your undergrad that you had first taken the cultural anthropology course? Yeah. And what was your perception of what an anthropologist was at that point? Um, they got to do... <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, one of the things that I, I laugh because as I'm thinking about this answer, I'm like, you know, what was really cool that stood out to me is because they do participant observation. Yeah. You know, they just get to stand, stand around and watch people. And I was like, I want to do that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know, so um, that that was striking for me. But um, the, the one thing and the, the videos and the discussions with anthropologists was they were wor- like many of them were working with the community, working with the pe- the people. And there was no hierarchy. I didn't see Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there wasn't like, oh, I'm a doctor and you have to listen to me. It was like, no, I, w- I want to listen to your story because you're an expert and uh, I want to, you know, learn and I want to work with. And I don't, uh, many anthropologists who I model myself after wasn't like, I just want your story so I can make a billion dollars off it, right? Mm-hmm. Or make money off it or, or get the fame from it. Um, maybe a billion is too much because you know, I've never heard of an anthropologist making a billion dollars, but... <laughs> Um, um, <laughs> yeah. the, the, you know, the, the thing is, um, you know, it was a lot of taking time and working with community, right? And knowing that the job's never done, um, you know, like Kobe Bryant, is job done? No, I didn't think so. Right. So I s- even with all the projects that I do, like I never, I never looked at it as like, okay, we did a project, let's wrap this up. It's done. Right. It's, um, it's like, okay, when, what's the ne- when's the next one? You know, what are we thinking through? Um, what, what are we going to do for the next one? And, you know, what topics are relevant for the community uh, that I want to work with, right? And and to some degree, I want to serve, right? Mm-hmm. Like, um, I think I'm a, I'm a vessel for knowledge, uh, with knowledge, sorry. And I think um, if I can share that with people and I do no harm approach and not to one where it's like Dr. Clark is talking, I think it benefits uh, people. But um, I also flip that, 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 like I mentioned, the people who I'm working with are experts and they're, and, and they're experts in their lived experience, right? And they're teaching me, mm. right? It's reciprocal, right? And, you know, even le- leaning into the word reciprocity, that comes from, you know, largely from anthropological thinking, right? And, you know, how dare, uh, dare us as anthropologists not lean into a res- building a balanced sense of reciprocity? That's well said. So you, you mentioned that you were interested in criminology originally. Yeah. And then you went into studying African studies? Yeah, so how the story went was um, I wanted to be a police officer. Okay. That's what I wanted to do. And uh, I went back to school to study up on, in criminology. Um, and the first days of class or school at uh, York uh, back in 2009, uh, I was told that um, criminology, the space for criminology was full. And I had to take my second choice, which, which was African studies. So I was like, okay, and but I could switch, you know, my third year. So I was like, all right, cool. And um, my first class was an anthropology. It was my first ever class uh, at, at university was anthropology, uh, introduction to anthropology. Wow. Yeah. And what was your passion for what you wanted to study at that point? Um, thank you. I'm going to be vulnerable in this yeah. interview, and I appreciate, uh, I trust that's okay, and it's, it's, pre- it's appreciated. Um, you know, I am, I'm from a low-income area. I grew up low-income. And um, I was always curious um, about why am I different? You know, why am I treated different? But I was always cu- also curious 
to know why am I also a black male uh, among some black men or young men, but I'm always treated differently, right? Um, Mm -hmm. A lot of it was because of my social class. You know, I didn't, I wasn't around, uh, and this is no shade to my parents at all, but my parents were immigrants uh, from Barbados and my dad, he, he worked uh, a, as a laborer, most of it um, in, in, um, um, in labor intensive jobs. And my mother, uh, she worked in, you know, secretarial positions. So I didn't have university, uh, parents who went to university, I, I had you know, good parents and they did their best, but um, we were low income. So, you know, when I went to like, you know, I remember going to like some church events and, you know, meeting with other kids and their parents who are black men, you know, these are black people. Um, their parents are lawyers or doctors or teachers. And, you know, that their social capital, using the words from Bordeaux, was much higher than mine based on um, the information that we're measuring, amo- measuring on, right? Like, you know, word choices, acad- academia. Um, uh, so there was, al- there was always a difference. And um, I, I always wanted to acknowledge that. I remember in... Uh, when I was an undergraduate student, I always had said, like, there, you know, we're talking about black men, but not all black men have the same lived experiences. Just like we're talking about white women, not all white women have the same lived experiences. When you see, um, you know, a, a homeless white woman, you know, in comparison to middle class or higher socioeconomic class, yeah, they may, you may look at them and say, well, they have white privilege, but one of those white women has more privilege than the other. You know, one has shelter, one has you know, access to money versus the other one is living on the street and can't eat and mm-hmm. may have kids who are doing the same. So we can't just say all white people embody the same lived experiences. It's the same thing with any other race or ethnic back, uh, uh, ethnic background of a person or people, a group of people. So I think, you know, we need to be um, very attentive to that, um, not only anthropology, but sociology and anything in to, in to do with res- research. You know, there's so much of homogenizing of our lived experiences, right? You know, you know the, the dangers of using, and I will say and be frank, the dangers of using BIPOC and POCs. That's that's a, a, a social discourse which is invisibilizing people and their differences, right? But yet we still use them. You know, I I refute. I am not a BIPOC. I am not a POC. And it's not to be. I'm refuting to be argumentative and be like I'm the villain and everybody should know. But it's like no, I I'm a human being and I mm-hmm. have my own individuality. But if we don't start with a starting point to, uh, to appreciate our humanness, then all we're doing is putting people in boxes. And we're never going to solve the problems of what we're having today when it comes to racial issues or anything to do with social oppression. So did you see anthropology as a way to study the unique lived experiences 100%, of different people? 100%, right? Like, I think anthrop- anthrop- uh, anthropology um, is that vehicle. Like, as much as I did my doctorate in sociology, you know, I, I definitely use anthropological think uh, uh, theory and, and, and understanding to unpack what it means to be a black young man mm. who was marginalized in a white settler colonized nation state, right? I sat with these young men, and yes, we experienced the racial and gender biases based on our op- the optics of what we look like, but I have more access, I have more privilege in them, right? I was a, I was a, fourth or fifth fourth year um phd candidate you know i was on interviews at cbc or ctv or um the conversation canada you know frequently versus these young men who are looking for jobs so how can we ever say my black masculine and their black masculine is the same it doesn't make sense so definitely anthropology can and it is an and a vehicle for us to unpack those those understandings those perceptions so you just mentioned that you got your doctorate in sociology yeah. could you share a bit more about your academic journey? Yeah, sure. So I did my uh, BA uh, with honors in anthropology at York University. Um, again, a shout out to, uh, to Dr. Malcolm Blinko, uh, who helped with that uh, that journey. Um, and then I did my master's degree at the University of Guelph uh, in public issues anthropology. Uh, shout out to Tad McElraith, mm-hmm. Professor McElraith, because he was another version of Malcolm Blinko. I wanted to slash his tires too. <laughs> okay. No, I'm just joking. I didn't want to slash his tires. Uh, but he, he really pushed me. Um, and Dr. D- uh, Saski Kawano, who was my supervisor at University of Guelph. I made the hard decision uh, to, uh, and I got to s- also shout out Professor Edward Hedekin at University of Guelph. Um, 
uh, he was he was very disappointed when I chose to leave anthropology and to pursue my doctorate in sociology. <laughs> I'll tell you a quick story uh, about that. But um, uh, I, I, I was at a crossroad where <coughs> I didn't feel anthropology was the discipline to help me mobilize my, my research. Mm. Um, I didn't feel at the time that anthropology, and it's not to say it is that, uh, that's true now, I think things are changing. But, um, you know, when I was finishing my master's, I felt that anthropology was focused, in Canada particularly, was focused on um, certain issues that were more prevalent to the discipline. Uh, and I'm not saying they are not, they are, but I think there was, um, there was over-appreciation for other fields of study. And my work was looking at marginalized young people, uh, particularly marginalized young black males, uh, and I didn't know any anthropologists or any anthropological work in Canada that was doing that. And I wasn't prepared to go to the United States to study. Um, you know, I had a you know, very young daughter at the time. She's older now. Um, so um, the choice was staying in Canada, obviously, and pursuing a doctorate that, in a discipline that I felt was um, more attentive to those issues that I was concerned with. Um, so sociology at Carleton University was um, my choice. I did apply for the anthropology department um, pr uh, program at Carleton, so I got into both. And this is where uh, Dr. <laughs> Hedekin comes in. Um, so I, I wanted his, he was a mentor to me as well at uh, University of Guelph, and uh, I reached out to him for his you know, feedback and thoughts about, okay, what direction should I go? He's like, I said to him, so yeah, I'm thinking about, uh, there was actually uh, two other disciplines. Um, community psychology at Wilfrid Laurier, uh, sociology. Yeah, no, it was only two, not three. So sociology and community psychology, but anthropology was in my mind as well. But I was not leaning towards anthropology. I was more towards like, community psychology or sociology. And uh, I said to him in email, I'm like, yes, yeah, so I'm thinking about, you know, moving on to do my doctorate, but I see myself doing community psychology. And... Uh, He's like, Warren, uh, do you mind if we, in any in, in email, he says, like, Warren, can you, do you mind if you just come see me uh, at my office, mm -hmm. like, tomorrow? I'm like, yeah, sure, I'm on campus. This is the University of Guelph. I remember getting to his office, and he sat me down, and he's like, no, you're an anthropologist. Oh, no. Do not leave anthropology. We need you. And I was like, again, I'm getting into this, like, this moment with two different professors, two different schools now, one at York University and now at University of Guelph who's telling me like I'm like this next anthropologist. And I'm like, what the heck is going on, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm humbled and I'm, I'm not saying that my work is uh, better than anybody. I, I just, I'm, I'm humbled by these experiences. Um, but I, ended, I still end up jumping ship. <laughs> um, not to laugh at Dr. Hedekin, I'm not doing that. That's, that's not good. But my main reason was my professor, my supervisor at uh, Carleton University, Dr. Jacqueline Canelli. Uh, her work um, is t closely connected to youth cultures, uh, neoliberalism, um, homeless youth, and it just it was it was a beautiful fit. Um, she pushed me so hard uh, to be the scholar that I am now. She pushed me so hard to think critically, and I I I, I am in so much debt to her like I, even though i'm technically quote unquote her colleague now uh i can never call her my colleague mm. um you know she really pushed me to be a sociologist um but also paying attention that i'm an anthropologist all right so she was also you know uh, you know encouraged me to think anthropologically on certain concepts and how i could bring that into my work and i was you know she she's just awesome Everybody needs to know Dr. Jacqueline Canelli. If you don't know her now, you know. She's at mm -hmm. Carleton University. She's an awesome professor. And I'm so humbled to, be, uh, to have been under her wing and learning. So I just answered your question. Yes. Could you give like a short, quick explanation of your perception of the differences between sociology and anthropology in terms of how it studies people? And yeah, good question. So sociology is focusing more on societies and how people move within society, um, how people understand, you know, themselves within different social structures uh, and what a enables or constrains them within those structures, using a lot of Bourdieu's work to explain that. 
um, anthropology, social culture anthropology, although um, it goes you know, follows down that road of what I explained. It's more looking at how culturally and how we understand ourselves through the place in which we live. So if you look at work of um, uh, Seta Lowe, uh, Dr. Seta Lowe, who talks about space and place, you know, it's about how do we understand ourselves within the cultural reality um, and how, th- how does that create our, our moments of understanding and perception of self. You know, I think those are, those are two distinct ways of explaining them both differently, but they're, they're very close. It's like, it's like they're married to one another, but they're divorced at the same time, mm. right? Because you're looking at different theories, um, you're looking at different approaches, and then, you know, you, you, you can use different ways of understanding people differently based on the, dis- the discipline. And I think it's really important to focus uh, on those nuances and never conflating them. Because by conflating them, I think, again, you're homogenizing, right? And then when you homogenize um, you know, disciplines, you know, you're stripping the, the essence of what it really is, right? The unique thing about, you know, anthropology is you're, I think you have the opportunity to delve deep, uh, with human with humanity right and you're understanding their 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 truths because there's multiple truths uh, versus sociology it's, I, I think it lends more with let's find what the truth is right so here's the truth mm. black people are this versus anthropology you know we can say okay well from a, a white uh, from a Canadian perspective we understand that black people are moving this way culturally based on this cult this Canadian cultural understanding right sociology doesn't do that too much right you know when we start unpacking you know white settler colonialism and what it means to it with blackness or whiteness or being Asian I think you're you're being anthropological right there's a there's a stark difference and could we go into now what you ended up doing your research on at Carleton University? Yeah, for sure. So I focused on mapping, or the, the title of my dissertation was Mapping the Experience of, um, of Unemployed, Underemployed, Marginalized, Afro-Caribbean Black Male Youth Who Utilize Youth Employment Training Programs uh, in Toronto, Montreal, and Ottawa. So I did a cross-comparison. The research not only focused on interviewing young people who are ACB, Afro-Caribbean Black, between the ages of 15 and 29, and again, marginalized, uh, but it focused on interviewing those who were employers who were working with these youth employment training programs, um, you know, fund- funders who funded these youth employment training programs, uh, and also the youth coordinators uh, who work within these youth employment training programs. So I was curious to understand how, do th- how does the, um, these youth employment training programs in this white settler Canadian, mo- Canadian moment understand anti-blackness and gender biases that these young people are experiencing, but how are they also... Uh, connecting marginalization or social class as another barrier for them to connect to jobs. So, you know, as much as these youth employment training programs were saying, well, yeah, we can, we, we have this advertising, advertising saying we can get these young people in the jobs, no problem, right? But the reality is, is that there, there's anti-black racism, gender biases, mm-hmm. and this sense of, you know, classism that's happening among these, th- these, sets, of, these sets of young people three different social oppressions at least, right? So how can we just say equitably that we can get them jobs? You know, that's a, that's a falsehood. That's what the research identified, right? Like a lot of these young people were going into, into job interviews and literally employers were saying, well, uh, enough with the street guys to the, to the youth, youth employment training program officers or coordinators, sorry, right? You had employers who are saying that these type of young people are no good for business optically right they don't look the part they're black and they're men right we can't say black people have all the same lived experiences because we look at black women or black girls versus black boys those are two different lived experiences right and on top of that you know there's this idea that because you get through this door this youth employment training program door you should be able to pick yourself up by the bootstraps and get into jobs. That's neoliberalism. Neoliberalism doesn't uh, consider race or ethnicity or gender. You know, it just says, oh, you're a human being that has two arms, two feet? Oh, you should be able to work. Mm. Right? And th- and neoliberalism entrenched not only to um, these places of work, but it's also entrenched within these youth employment training programs as well. These, these programs have quotas to meet. It's like, get these bodies into jobs. 
foot and how are, how are they considering the difference of oppressions that's happening among the young people they want to serve so like a, it's like a catch-22 so would you say that your research was connected to broader issues of racism happening in Canada yeah 100 percent I think you know when we look at racism it's not racism it's racisms mm. right when we think about anti-indigenous racism versus anti-black racism those are two different types of racism right like we cannot say you know that's why it's very dangerous to, to, to mention BIPOC and POCs because you're saying these group of people uh, we're homogenizing them first and we're saying that they have the same lived experiences because they're BIPOC but if you think about it people have different lived, lived experiences based on race gender sexuality right so I can't say it share the same discrimination as someone who's a BIPOC. It, do, it doesn't make sense, right? So, you know, this research, it, it, it acknowledges that these are, yes, black men, and they're facing a discrimination, but they're facing a discrimination not only on race, but gender, but also classism, right? So, and that's what's most important, uh, one of the key takeaways, sorry, from this research. And I also mentioned that you had two projects and that they're still ongoing projects. So the Afro-Caribbean Mentorship Program, was this was based at Carleton University or? Yeah, so that was um, that was a, another a beautiful accident. You know, I was the, at the time uh, in the department, I was the only black male graduate student uh, at Carleton. And, um, you know, a few undergraduate students who were racialized because they were not just black they were east asian as well um did i say that right i think i did yeah um but um they were curious as to how like how did i get into a graduate program and why are you here not in a bad way but it's like well we've never seen a black guy mm. doing yeah. this here right and i was like oh okay so it, it turned into a conversation at the library and then asking me questions about how i applied to grad school and and what are the steps i took and um you know, I said, oh, hey, you know, you know what, um, I, I can sit down with you folk on the evening, um, bring your friends, and uh, we can, you know, you know, talk it out. So it was like a Wednesday night. I had my green hoodie on. I looked like the Green <laughs> Goblin from Spider-Man because I was just like <laughs> study mode. <laughs> and um, 80 people show up to wow. this, this room, and I was, I was taken aback. I was like, what the heck is this, right? And... Um, it turned in, it was supposed to be set for an hour. Someone had to go get nachos and stuff. Well, they didn't have <laughs> to, but they elected to because just to feed people. Mm. And it turned into this um, initiative that uh, I didn't see happening at all. I didn't, uh, I'm humbled that I was able to work with people to get it off the ground, which we did. It wasn't just Warren, but um, it was a, a lot of work, but and still is. But it was an uh, initiative that turned into um, appreciating the experiences of not only African descent, but ra other racialized people, uh, or racialized people alongside African descent people, let me say it that way, um, who have their difference of, in ethnicities, uh, and how do we create space for them to learn and understand that there's mentorship and there's support uh, and there's help, right? And it's not to say the universities don't have help. One of the things that uh, I continue to learn from the universities is that it's not just putting together a workshop. It's not just putting together um, an event, right? We have to think about access, right? Just because the door is open doesn't mean people can access, right? We have to think about access in a way in terms of how people feel comfortable walking into that room. How do people feel associated with other people walking into that room? That's all a part of access. And we lose sight of that, you know, I, you know as much as, the, for example, um, when I was putting together events at the beginning of this, the afro Caribbean Mentor Program, you know, I got I got emails from students um, who were non-racialized or white students saying, uh, I'm in your class, I want to come to this. They're already pointing to, I don't feel I have access to this um, event because it's, it's written as like it's a black focused, mm. right? So we have to think about what access is for students. We also have to think about who are facilitating these events, these programs, these initiatives as well, right? Do they do they carry that same homogenizing sense of, of racialized people who have their own differences of, and of identity? Because if they are, then how are they going to give them help? How are they going to pay attention to this person in, in their individuality if you're just thinking everyone's the same? 
And that goes for anybody. It's not just a white person doing to that someone who is who is racialized, but that can happen with someone who's non-white. It happens. It's it's about a social discourse that we all uh, have come to normalize and how we identify people in our Canadian moment. So we have to think critically about what access is and how do we sustain access for people so they feel a sense of belonging in moments of learning. That's why we're Jordans in high schools. Because they see Warren, the cool professor, with a pair of Air Jordans, and they think, I'm cool. Mm. Right? That's yeah. giving them a sense of access to Warren. But if I came into a high school and to teach high school students with a suit and tie, and I was like, call me Dr. Clark, they'd be like, yo, this guy's maybe too smart for me. I don't, I don't want to deal with this guy. Right? Or they made me think I'm stuck up. So I can't access them. Right? So we got to think of what access is. Is this program still <clears throat> going on? Yeah, it is. Slowly but surely. So uh, I'm very humbled to know that we've expanded it at the University of Ottawa, and it's still there. So there's a chapter there, so it's it's going. Um, and then we, we're now expanding it here at uh, University of Manitoba. Um, so we had our first event last month, uh, How to Get into Grad School event. Okay. Um, and I think you said you attended that, didn't yes, you? Yes, I yeah. virtually attended okay, it, Okay, yeah. perfect. So... We had great speakers, Jamie Moses, uh, NDP, MLA, um, MLA, Jamie Moses attended, gave a talk. Uh, Michelle Lamonius, Dr. Michelle Lamonius, sorry, she gave an amazing talk. Uh, and then I just did the workshop that I usually do every year. So um, we have a couple of events lined up. We have our January month event of addressing mental health as anti-blackness as a mental health concern coming up. Um, we have a movie night coming up to screen The Woman King, which we're working on right now. So we have so many things happening. Um, I'm really trying to stop with me doing the programming. <laughs> so I am hiring a coordinator. So, it, you know, if this gets out and people are like, hey, Warren, I'm interested to learn, learn more. Please email me. Okay. Thank you for sharing all that information with us. And then your other project is Barbershop Talks. Could you maybe explain more about what that has looked like? Yeah, so another beautiful accident. I'll start by saying that um, one evening I had dreads, long dreads, like down to my my back, my like lower back area. And uh, I was like, you know, I'm over this, um, this style. And uh, I, there was no spiritual connection or anything to it. But um, I went to go cut them off at a barber barbershop. And uh, the conversation I got into, and I was like, whoa. I haven't been to a barber in, like, years because I was growing my hair, right? I just shaved myself, so there's no real reason for me to go to a barber shop. And um, I got an amazing conversation, you know, about basketball, sexuality, Jordans. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I said, what would be an amazing idea if we were to, you know, put together a an event that focuses on the barbershop and um, in doing so we could um, focus on how do we appreciate people and their differences so when we did the first one it was um, we scheduled for like 10 people and then we had about we had 40 people show up to this packed barbershop in Ottawa and it, it was an appreciation of understanding the misconceptions of black masculinity um, but how do we focus on ways of how do we, you know, focus on ways of the nuances and um, how do we appreciate young black men and boys and the struggles that they're going through in society, gun violence being one of them. Um, so we kept doing this as appreciation of honoring the barbershop and the relationship that barbers and young men and boys, black men and boys have with their, uh, their clients and the amazing and beautiful and nuanced conversations that are taking place. And I just want to briefly congratulate you because you recently received the Community Builder Award in 2022 presented by United Way East Ontario Uh for your research and community work stemming from your time at Carleton University. Yeah, yeah, that was, um, they tricked me. (laughs) I I don't like awards. I really don't. I I, I mean, when I say I don't like awards, I I don't do the work that I do for an award. I don't do the work that I do for recognition. I do the work I do because I love it. You know, I really love it. There's days where it's like, oh, I'm exhausted. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything. And um, uh, I remember, I remember, I always say it to people, like, you don't owe me anything. And uh, one morning, they're like, Warren, come to a meeting. I was like, okay, yeah. And um, come to this meeting, they're like, congratulations. I was like, 
congratulations for what? And they're like, you won the well, won the Community Builder Award for 2022. And I was like, well, okay. <laughs> but as much as the, the plaque sits on in my office, I'm of mind that it's n- I didn't win anything. Who, If anybody won, it's the community members who I worked with. We all won. You know, we all should be recognized. And that's how I, s- I stay away from being that anthropologist who's like, yeah, I've taken from community. And um, I'm I'm going to, you know, reap the rewards. I think the community who I work with should reap the rewards just as much. It's their lived experience. Mm. I just was able to tell a story. And going back to your research, is there some things that you've learned that you think others should know more about in terms of the communities that you've studied and worked with? I think one thing I would share is cultural competency. Even as anthropologists, we we cannot assume that we know one culture of group of people on our first encounter meeting with them. I think, you know, breaking bread and finding ways to continue to uh, develop uh, relationships of solidarity is a way to develop cultural competency. Because if you know anything about cultural competency, cultural competency is is an ongoing learning tool, right? And it's um, something that you continue to um, be open-minded uh, you continue to be appreciative, um, and you work in the parameters of continue to learn people and their differences. And that's one thing that I would encourage people to focus on. Um, no matter if you're, you're white, black, you know, whatever racial ca- and ethnic category is cultural competency, you mm-hmm. know, and, and being humbled and in, in learning people. So I guess overall, um, you are now an anthropologist, here I at, guess so. <laughs> at <laughs> University of Manitoba, yeah. based on people's perceptions of what an anthropologist is, and that usually looks like doing research, writing research articles, but essentially staying separated from the general public or the communities. How would you say that the way you do anthropology is maybe different from those perceptions? Again, leading on Rob Brofowski, a public anthropology, um, I just, I'm always in community. You know, I think that is the unique thing about the work that I do. It doesn't set me apart to be better or different. Well, different maybe, but not better. Um, Because how dare I as an anthropologist go into community, take work and be like, I wrote an article. Let Mm. me reap the rewards, right? Like, um, as a black man, I'm privileged. I'm very privileged. Like, I get to do interviews like this. They're cool. You know, tomorrow morning, I'm on CBC talking about Wakanda forever. Right, and I get the opportunity to watch it free tonight, and then go share my mind and thoughts on on this movie. Right, like you know, I'm I'm very humbled and I appreciate everything I've have and the opportunities I have, but everything that I have is from the people I've worked with. Right, so you know, I would definitely you know appreciate and acknowledge that my public anthropology approach as a public scholar <coughs> will always be something that I do. And it's always going to be something that it's going to, I believe, will benefit people. It gives us a sense of appreciation um, for people. Mm, yeah. yeah, and I'm I'm also actually in the course Public Anthropology, um, but instead of taking it in my second year, I'm in mm. my fourth year now. And yeah, it's definitely a course that's focusing on direct benefits to communities and how anthropologists can be better at doing that. So if we think about anthropology as an institution, what do you think anthropology needs to do a better job of in terms of incorporating more awareness and action towards anti-racism within the discipline? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I think we need, again, I'm going back to cultural competency. I think we need to, as one, as anthropologists, we need to check our privilege. I really do. I think we, I think, uh, not in our department, um, but I'm speaking generally, I think we need that we have an opportunity to, to know to recognize that we have we have accessed book of knowledge and books of knowledge and understanding and um, knowing that we need to replace ourselves one of these days. Right. Like I'm always thinking about that. I'm, al- I'm always thinking about, OK, well, one of these days I'm going to have to hang up that bat mantle right, or that bat cape and park the Batmobile and. It's gonna. It's just gonna sit there, but wouldn't it be cool if I was to find my replacement and watch them be Batman? That'd be cool. Mm-hmm. You know, let them yeah. let them swing from from uh, rooftop. You know, I think to to focus on 
you know, anti-racism. I think it's also focused on anti-racisms, right? And I think our department is doing that, not just because they hired me, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, I think there's more awareness. Not only our department, I think it stretches our faculty. I think um, there's a more of a, a, a need to appreciate a DEI, um, anti-oppression, anti-racism framework. And that starts with practice. It doesn't start with just defining it and saying we, we do it. I think that's what we're doing now. That's the temperature that I feel in our faculty. Um, just working with, you know, uh, Associate Dean um, um, Heidi Marks. You know, I've had some amazing conversations. I, I definitely want to shout out Dr. Kathleen Buttle. Right, she's doing fantastic uh, social culture anthropology work and has been. Um, so, I think when you have people like that that are really attentive to wanting to see that change in inclusivity, I think you know we, we can we as uh, University of Manitoba we can start setting the tone. I think to change that narrative of how anthropology is done in Canada, I really do. I think this podcast is one way. Um, you're asking critical conversations. Um, I'm seeing my colleagues like Dr. Kent Fowler, who's who, who just gave an interview with Shanae, right? I think those are ways in, in highlighting what we're doing as a department in a mainstream Canadian academic discourse. I think it starts to speak that, hey, we are being attentive to this stuff. This is this is who we are. You know, because a lot, as I mentioned in the other interview, I think I mentioned it today, people don't even know what anthropology is. Mm. You know, people think anthropology is actually sociology, but the person who said anthropology, got they just got the words mixed up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? So I think um, this public approach is a good way, and I think it holds us, us accountable because people should be like, hey, I remember you said that, Warren. So how come you're not doing it? Right? So it keeps, it keeps us accountable, and I think, again, focus on cultural competency as that uh, key term. Uh, it will help. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. And one last quick question. Okay. Since coming to Winnipeg, yeah. do you have a favorite place to hang out here in the city? Um, not yet. Not yet. Not okay. yet. Uh, I came during COVID, so I think I, I have a place, but I've only went there once, and I didn't go with a group of people. I think I may be asking some of my colleagues or students if you ever want to go to that board game cafe. Oh, across uh, the board. Across the board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, love, I love board game. But I haven't... I, the, p- the people I went with, and there's no shot to them, right? They're, <laughs> okay. They were kind of lame, you know? <laughs> they were kind of lame. They, they didn't want to play any board games. I was like, I, like, who comes to a board game cafe and don't want to play games, right? They just wanted to get a tea, and I get it. We were socializing. I think that that could be my place, but I haven't, I haven't found a group of people yet to go with. Okay, well, we might have to organize some anthropology across the board group. Yeah, I'm down. I also <coughs> like playing board games, so I'm that's down. awesome. I'm down. Well, Dr. Clark, thanks so much for speaking with us today about the projects that you've founded and the research that you're working on, and also kind of showing us what an anthropologist can look like today. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Great initiative. So this concludes the second episode here on Human to Human. If you are new to anthropology, I hope you are able to gain a bit of a better understanding of what sociocultural anthropology is and how people go about studying it. I also hope you will tune into episode three, where I do an interview with my second guest, Garth Sutton, who is currently a PhD student in archaeology here at the University of Manitoba. In my conversation with Garth, he shares with us how his time doing archaeological fieldwork in Manitoba has been closely tied to the relationships he has formed with the Paguas First Nation community, as well as provides us with a brief explanation of what cultural resource management is and why most archaeological work in Canada is focused in this area. So stay tuned as that episode will be out in two weeks time. And if you want to hear more from this podcast, Human to Human is available for listening on several platforms. We are on Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, as well as hopefully Apple very soon. And if you like this episode or have any questions, it would be great to hear from you in the comment section. Uh, We also have an email that you can contact the podcast through and that will be included in the description box down below. I would also like to give a special thanks to the people at UMFM for providing me with the space and equipment to make this podcast possible, as well as the Department of Anthropology for funding this project. And of course, Dr. Laura rosenoff Govin, Dr. Warren Clark, and Dr. William Flynn at Carleton University, who have been some of my biggest supporters in making this project happen. 
Thanks again for listening, and I hope you join me, Sarah Schur, on the next episode of Human to Human.